speak enough for 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's do this. So today I thought that I would start um, right away with modeling. So as you know, um, last time I, we wrote the remarks here from scratch, we had a blank shader, like a black uh, shader that did nothing and we wrote everything from scratch. Today, you know, in the spirit of just focusing on modeling and equations and maths, uh, I already have the skeleton of a rain marcher here. Um, if you don't know how to build a rain marching shader, we will do another tutorial about that um, sometime later. It's not too difficult. You can also go to the last stream that we did and check it out. But at this point, we have a sphere in the screen. Uh, I do have a rotating camera, which um, is it rotating though? It should be rotating. Let me check down there. Uh, it is rotating. Yes. Or it should be. Well, we'll see. As soon as we would do something that is not a sphere, we will see if it's rotating or not. And I do have a sphere. So, as you know, the map function, uh, it kind of has become the standard way to code uh, an SDF definition in shader toy. You, you have a point P in space, and you return basically a distance, a floating point number, which tells you how far that point is from the closest thing in the scene. So the scene in this case is just a sphere, and P is the query points, and the ray marcher, which we won't go through today, um, the ray marcher is gonna be querying this map function multiple times, millions of times, maybe billions of times uh, to complete an image. And this is the responsible function for defining the scene. Uh, in this case, it's a sphere, uh, because we have the SDF of a sphere, the distance field of a sphere. This sphere is centered in the origin and has a radius of 0 0.2 units. Normally, I kind of think of my units in shader toy in meters, because it's kind of natural to me. So a meter is about this big. So we are talking of a sphere, which is about this big. Um, we are watching it from about a meter distance, so that's why it, it fits uh, nicely in the viewport. And the SDF for the sphere, as you might know, is just uh, the length of the point minus the radius. So actually, let's see if I got everything right with my uh, second camera. And just for the sake of, you know, basic introduction to SDF, uh, let's compute that SDF to a sphere. So that's going to be our sphere which has a given center. In this case, it's, it's at the origin of the x, y axis. And there's a point P in a space, which has 3D coordinates. I'm going to be drawing everything in 2D. Um, I won't really worry about, you know, doing fancy 3D drawings here in the paper, because all the equations we are going to do today, uh, you can reason about them in two dimensions. And just by replacing, you know, VEC2 by VEC3, everything just generalizes properly to 3D space. So we have a point P, we have a sphere of, you know, radius R, and the distance to the sphere, which is this thing here, this is what we want to compute, D, that distance here, is simply the distance from the point to the center minus this distance here, which is the radius. So basically, we are taking the distance is going to be the length of P, and I'm using vertical bars to you know define the the length which you can compute with your regular pythagoras theorem and then you subtract the radius and or big r uh, as in the drawing and that's your distance easy peasy um, distances will be positive on the outside so this is going to be d bigger than zero in the inside they are going to be negative and that's why we call them signed distance fields because they can take both positive and negative values and then they are going to be exactly uh, d equals zero at the edge. So the, the task of the ray marcher basically is to find uh, all these points at the very edge by querying the map function multiple times and getting closer and closer to points where d equals zero. Uh, just last note, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, this length of p is just you know like p, uh, the three components of p. Uh, squared. This is the Pythagoras theorem, and here p x, p y, p c are the x, y, c components of the point p, 
And this you can encode in GLSL just by the by using the length uh, function. So that's what we are doing in the shader here. We have uh, length of p minus r, easy, and that gets uh, gets us our sphere. So let's replace this by a box, and this is now where uh, we start doing things a bit more fancy. Um, all right, let me remove that paper. Um, and let's go back to the math here. All righty, so let's make this box happen. Um, so we have a box. A box is just uh, basically a 3D rectangle. Um, we are going to also make it centered at the origin to simplify things. Um, later on, when we want to move the box somewhere else in space, we will just some, add some offsets to the point P. Basically, we will transform P with the inverse transform of the thing we want for the box. If we want to move the box to the right, you know, we will actually keep it at the origin and move the point to the left, the evaluation point. If we want to rotate it, uh, you know, like 20 degrees in one direction, what we will do is keep the box stationary and move and rotate P in the opposite direction by the same amount. So uh, keeping uh, the shapes at the origin simplifies the equations a lot, and I normally like doing that. So just like the sphere, um, we are going to call this size here R, X, and radius Y. I'm going to use radius. It's not like the boxes have a radius, but just for you know being a bit consistent, and I think it's kind of convenient to use half length instead of the whole height and width of the box. So, all right, um, so these are the x and the y axis, as we know. Uh, there we go. So the first thing I try to do when I uh, try to define or um, discover a new SDF is to try to find as many symmetries as I can right away. Um, you know, like in the case of the sphere, the length operator kind of doesn't care where the point is next to the sphere. It can be on the right, on the left. The length is always going to work. But in this case, because we have you know horizontal and vertical edges, being on the right side of the box or on the left side can change things. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, just focus only on one of the quadrants, on the top right quadrant, where all the coordinates of P are positive. You know, they are on the X positive side of things and the vertical vertically on the positive Y axis. So we are working only on this quadrant here and we are not going to care about all of that area here. So that means that the very first thing we are going to do in our SDF evaluator is to take P and compute the absolute value of P, which means that anything that is negative will become positive. So if the point happened to be here, on the top left, because the x is negative, the y is still positive because it's on the positive side of the um, of the uh, vertical plane, but it is on the left side of the y-axis. So by using the abs value, the x component of p, which is negative, will become positive, and that will effectively uh, move the point here to the right side and make it fall in the first quadrant, where we can then later evaluate our SDF. Similarly, if the point is down here, uh, through the abs value, the point will actually move up there. And if it's up here, if it's down there on the bottom left, it will move to the top right. So that way, we are already simplifying many of our potential if statements uh, to uh, way fewer than we would have if we were considering all the possible cases where the point is on the left and on the bo left bottom and on the bottom only, but not on the left, and so on and so on. So now that we know that our point is going to be on the top right or in the first quadrant of the plane, uh, we have to see which cases we have. And there are a few cases where computing the distance is super easy. So let me draw these two extra lines here. And remember, this is the box, the physical box we are computing the distance to. And these lines are just helper lines. So if the point happens to be around here in this area, which I'm going to call area 1, uh, which is above the box, but not to the right of the far right side of the box. Uh, th th that's one case. We have 
p here and the distance to the box in that case is just this vertical distance here d and that distance uh let's okay let's do it let's put one for the case one and the distance in that case is going to be well this distance is just the vertical component of p which is all of this amount minus this amount which is the ri the the radius of the box in the y direction so the distance is just you know py minus r and just now a dot uh, for the component a bit like in glsl if p would be a vect3 then y would be the y component right um so that's very easy the other ca the other easy case is where um when p falls on the right side of the box and below the top side of it in this area which we can call area two and in that case the distance is just this amount here which is you know how much to the right p is compared to the side of the box this amount here and that's going to be the x component of the point minus the um, horizontal radius of the box or half the width of the box so that's super easy and so far so good we are doing progress so let's see now the third case which is when p falls in this corner which is both to the right and bo and also above uh you know the the box boundaries it's to the top right of the corner basically and in that case the closest thing in the box to that point p is the corner itself so this is the distance we are interested in this is the distance we are looking for it's that diagonal here uh, if the point was there then it would be that thing of course um so this distance it's pretty easy to compute um if we think of pythagoras again we have a right triangle here and d is the hypotenuse of that thing so let's see i'm gonna write it uh, like hypothesis hypotenuse squared is you know uh, one side squared plus the other side squared and uh, let's do this side first this side this amount is similar to the case number two is the x component of p minus this so it's basically all of that minus that and that gives us this distance so that's going to be px minus radius x squared and similarly the vertical component of that triangle uh, of, of the point p relative to the corner is going to be the y component of the point minus the radii radius in the y component squared so these are our three um cases and before going deeper into the maths and simplifying all of this to something more beautiful let's go ahead and code it uh, to make sure that our intuition so far is good that all of this that we did it is correct um, that's something i do often when i'm writing these sdfs i go back and forth between you know the pencil line equations on paper and the actual code to make sure that at every step I'm doing the right thing that I didn't mess up the maths it's like I'm not strong enough in maths as to know for sure that everything I do is always correct in the case of the box it's easy but when you are working with cubic equations and things you might mess things up so doing periodic checks on code is good for me so let's do here let's do an SD box uh, of a point P in space and just like in the sphere instead of a we are going to have a radius, but instead of a float, it's going to be a VEC3, as I was saying, because we are going to have three radius, one in X, Y in Y, and Y in C. And we are going to return something here. And let's, you know, let's start making a box here um, of size, I don't know, something like that. I'm going to make it in different sizes. so we see that it's a box you know if i was making the three amounts the same it would be a cube and we might still mess up something in the code an x with a y or a y with a c or something and we wouldn't see the difference because all of them were the same so let's make them all different so if something goes wrong we can see it right away and now so let's code this thing that we had so the first thing we did in paper was to compute the absolute value to make sure we are working on the first quadrant and then we have three cases case one was when the point was above um, above the 
above the box and on the left side and in that case we decided that the distance would be uh, this thing then we had the case where we were on the right side and below and in that case we said the distance would be the coordinate the x coordinate of the point minus um, uh, minus the x, uh, x component of the box size and so on and so on but you know what i think i'm not going to do this actually because this is going to become actually we have multiple cases we have one two three cases in 3d so okay this is gonna get messy very quickly so let's go back to the uh, paper and keep doing the maths actually so we don't have to code all of that mess all right so this is where we are and coding this is complicated and error prone and not efficient because the gpu would have to branch across all those uh, if statements that we have here and as you know uh, this is not good for the gpu because uh, i mean i'm not a gpu architect or a gpu expert or even a graphics you know game engine developer but as you know all the shaders uh, are split in you know millions of pixels and every pixel is rendered by a thread and groups of threads or group of pixels run the same shader at the same time in lockstep which means that um, you know every instruction in your shader is going to be read by all the threads they will run it and then they will move together to the next instruction or to the next uh, sequence of instructions in the GLSL code. Uh, what that means is that if uh, different threads or different pixels, because the rays of the ray marcher are going in slightly different directions, had to go through different branches in this sequence of if statements, then um, some threads would, would want to go through one of the branches, the other threads would want to go through the other ones, but, but the GPU architecture doesn't allow for that because all the threads have to go in lockstep. So they have to be running the same instructions. So what ends up happening is that some of the threads, well, all the threads will run all the if statements and evaluate all those cases, the case one, case two, case three, all of them, and they will kind of invalidate the ones that don't apply to them. What that means basically is that um, it's very inefficient. And in some cases, the GPUs can branch and actually, you know, they verge and start going from specific paths. Uh, but then some threads have to wait for others to reach the same point so they can resume the lockstep operations. Yeah. So it's not good. So we're going to try to get rid of all these if statements, both for GPU efficiency, uh, also for mathematical clarity or elegance. So let's go ahead. So the first thing to do is to try to generalize these three cases to a single case. And of course, uh, the way to do that is to take the most complex of them all, which is the case number three, and see if case one and two can fit in it so that we don't need them anymore. And that might imply some redundant operations, but again, it, that might be faster than trying to branch or do other fancy things on the shader. So this one clearly is the most complex as in having more operations in it of the three. So we are trying to uh, make case one and case two special cases of case three. And that's pretty easy to do because if you know, if you realize this thing happens to exist right there and the uh, case one distance which is the difference between the y component of the point and the um, uh, semi height of the box that thing is also embedded right there so what we could do is to try to always evaluate this thing and make sure that the things that don't need to be there become zero when they don't need to be there. For example, in case number two, uh, we want this thing to become zero. And in case number one, we want this thing to become zero. And that's pretty easy to do because if you realize in case number two, for example, where we want this thing to be zero, this thing happens to be negative because we happen, the point, um, uh, sorry, when we are in the case number two, this thing happens to be negative, correct? Because the point is below the height. So PY minus radius is gonna be a negative number. And if it's negative, it means case number two, we want to make it zero so that this thing simplifies, you know, the squares will go away and we are back to case number two equation. So if something is negative and we want to make it zero, and if that's the goal, that's pretty easy. We can just use a max function, right? So if something is negative, 
let's make it zero. So what we can do is to compute max of py minus r y and do this squared and similarly we can do the same for the x component where if we are in case number one what we want is to evaluate this thing which means that px minus rx is going to be zero or we want it to be zero what happens to be is that it is negative because we are in case one uh, which means we are on the left side of the uh, this boundary line so px minus rx is negative here let's make it zero just with a max function again so px minus rx squared and this is our distance squared and this well i mean you can simplify now by or isolate d by computing the square root of all of these uh, and now this thing works for cases one two and three in case number two uh, this thing is zero. In case number one, this becomes zero. In case number three, both are positive. The max function does nothing. Well, I forgot to put a zero here. Uh, but this equation basically describes all the cases. And just for the sake of doing uh, GLSL notation, this would be the length of a vector. And now, a ve of a vector with components max of py minus ri and max px minus rx. Uh, max over zero, of course. So now we can combine those two things in a single vector, which is just the max of p minus r over zero. So that means that, you know, the max, so p minus r now it's a, a 2D or a 3D vector. Uh, it has three components, px, rx, and the components will be px minus rx, py minus ri, and pc minus rc. The max will operate on those three components at once, uh, invalidating or masking out those dimensions that don't uh, need to be applied for cases one and two. And then the length will take care of the last uh, square root and computing the length of that vector. So I think that's all that we need to compute the distance to a box. So if we go here, um, what we can do is p equals, well, let's call this something else, d equals, no, not d. Uh, v for vector pi minus r uh, p minus r and now we compute the max of that and zero and now we return the length of v and this is our vector three and that's our box let me make it a bit bigger there we go slightly bigger there we go um, just for the sake of removing temporaries and make it even clearer we can you know, in line that's in there, and when it says p, we can just put absolute value of p, and there we go. That creates uh, an SDF for a box. Uh, there it is. Um, let me see how the chat is going. Okay, no more comments, which is good. All right, so this is the box. One of the tricks we use a lot in SDF modeling is to round shapes, you know, like something that uh, you look, na nature or reality never has like sharp edges. You never see a perfectly sharp edge, even something like, um, um, you know, the edge of a door or a window or, or, or a phone or a table. The edge is, has always some amount of roundness. There is no perfectly mathematically perpendicular surfaces in reality and uh, that's a good idea to do to any modeling that you are doing just don't make 90 degrees stuff if you're making a game and you're a coder and you're programming your own art just try to round the corners doesn't cost much well it does cost a lot if you're using polygons right isn't it doesn't it it's like you have to add extra polygons a whole new you know edge loop or a ring and or two of them and then you have to create extra polygons there and it's a lot of complexity topology gets weird quickly but with sdfs it is super fast and super easy to round any shape and the only thing we need to do is to take uh, you know the sdf of the box and subtract a little amount from it uh, like let's say 0 0.1 now let's make something smaller so now we have a rounded box. Um, and that's the difference between rounding and not rounding. And I can explain actually, okay, let's explain why this works uh, like this. I didn't plan for this, but I think it's interesting. Um, so the rounding works by, 
if you think about this again, I'm going to be drawing now on the bottom left because I have more space, but we have been working on the top right uh, quadrant, but uh, the same principles apply. So we have these three cases where distances here, if we were, you know, uh, drawing ISO lines or lines of equal distance to the box, we would get uh, something like that because the distance in the case uh, number two is just the horizontal distance to the edge of the box. In case number one, distances are just um, the same on horizontal lines because the distance is just the vertical uh, separation between the point and the edge of the box. And then in case number three, where the distance is kind of the equation of a circle with the hypotenuse and the square root of the squares of the sides and all of that, uh, what happens is that the distance field uh, takes this shape. It becomes like a like a circle, basically. That's what it becomes. Uh, so this is the distance field for the box. Is this ISO lines? Uh, well, this is one representation for it. So what we are taking is the zero uh, ISO surface, which means the solid object, the box we are rendering. The, the, the surface that the ray marcher is uh, trying to locate and render is the one where the distance is zero. You know, we have here negative distances, uh, but this is the zero uh, distance isosurface. And what happens now by uh, taking the whole distance that we had here and subtracting a small, I don't know, I'm going to call it um, B for a, a border or a, b a boundary or something or or a band. Um, that if we subtract a little border B, what we are making is pushing the distance field outwards. Basically, something that was at a distance of two, for example, if B equals two, uh, then something that was at to a distance of two now that becomes the zero of the surface, which means that now instead of rendering these iso lines, we are going to render this iso line. You know, like this is. D equals 1, D equals 2, distance equals 3, and let's say B equals 2. Now the D equals 2, D equals 2 minus 2 is 0, this is the 0 ISO line, and this is what we are rendering. And as you can see from the distance field itself, uh, we are now embedding or adding this round corner of the box to the uh, um, surface to the distance field. So now we get a rounded box. And that's uh, and, and the same applies to almost every shape that has uh, corners. Like imagine that you had the SDF to a, the SDF to a star or something like that. And you know the ISO lines would be similar to the box. You would have like straight lines here for the SDF, but then here where these lines do that there is like a round shape to the SDF and the same here like that so the I the zero iso surface of the star SDF is going to be a spiky star but as soon as you re you know remove some amount from the SDF and you find the new and you try to find a new iso surface you're going to get this rounding effect um which is just a you know it's just a consequence of the Euclidean distance metric that we are using. So anyway, rounding is very easy to do in SDFs. I guess that's the <laughs> I guess that's the point I wanted to make. And we can take advantage of it. So let's make a, a round box because why not? It's gonna look better, you know, than a square box again because uh, things are not sharp in reality, and it's free. So just yes, let's do it. And now I'm gonna. The next step is gonna be now to apply some repetition. I'm gonna make a gear, you know, in the shader. It's like a uh, this circular shape with a lot of teeth uh, made of boxes. We are gonna t we are gonna take this one box and instantiate it multiple times uh, around the circle to make the shape of uh, a sphere. Uh, sorry, a gear. So let's do something like that. Um, I don't know. That will work. I guess that will work. All right. So let's do this. How do we do that? Well, there's a trick um, to do. So the naive way would be to you know make a for loop and add twelve of those boxes in the SDF, and one at different. All of them at different locations, and that's very expensive because we are evaluating 
12 boxes. And there is this mathematical uh, trick similar to the one we used with the box to do evaluations only on the first quadrant instead of in the four of them. We do can do the same to do evaluations only in the first teeth of all the sequence of 12 teeth that we are going to have. And we are going to do that by moving the point of evaluation to that first uh, teeth. So with the get of the box, we had points anywhere in the plane, and we were moving them all to the first quadrant with an absolute value, making sure that that movement would result in a new point which would have the same distance to the box as the original point. That's the whole trick, right? So we are going to be doing the same, where we are going to have, in theory, all these 12 teeth around the circle, but only one of them is going to be the real one. And any point that is close to any of the other 11 po uh, teeth, we are going to move it next to the first teeth or tooth uh, and place it, place it in a location such that the distance to the first tooth is the same as the distance would be from the original point to the closest tooth. And that's, <laughs> that's complicated to explain, so let's draw it again. Uh, let's do more math before typing code. So let's remove this thing. Uh, uh, what is this, by the way? Okay, this is a form. I use a lot of forms and papers and things that I get in the mail to do my equations normally. Normally I use actually post uh, kind of letters from banks and advertising and crap like that. Um, but today I have some forms, I don't know what they are, I don't care. So, we are going to have our... I'm going to do the drawing with, let's say, 8 instead of 12 because it's easier, but let's say we have one teeth, one tooth, sorry, here, and then we are going to have this other, you know, virtual tooth of the gear, like that, so something like that. And what we realize is that any point in a space, the closest tooth to the point is going to be based on where the point uh, lands in the plane. For example, uh, let's take those semi-angles here between exactly, these are bisectors between the locations of these uh, of these teeth. So if any point that lays in this sector here, this is going to be the closest um, tooth to it. So this is the distance we are interested in computing, the distance to that box here. So what we can do is, if we are in this sector, knowing that only this box here is the real box, what we can do is to move this point all the way there, where it has the same distance to the original, to the to the only one real box as it would have fit to this other tooth if it was in this sector. So we are going to perform a rotation, a rotation basically of P uh, to this first or primary, I don't know how to call them, sectors, I guess. So this is sector zero, the only one we care about. This is going to be, you know, sector one, sector two, three, four and so on and so on so whenever we first we will have to detect in which sector p is and the sectors go to infinity of course i just made the boundary here to uh, kind of express the circular symmetry of the whole thing but uh, a point p here still uh, falls in the sector number five um, so first we are going to detect in which sector the point is and then um, rotate the point all the way to the first sector uh, by some amount so that it lays on the first sector but still relative to that box in the same location as it is relative from this point to the box here. And then we can evaluate our box SDF normally. So, all right, I think this is what we need. Let's try to code this. Um, yeah, I think I, I will go back and forth between code and um, on paper. So first thing, let's move this point a little bit to the right by... we're gonna move the, po uh, the box, sorry. So uh, as you can see here, the box is no longer at the origin of the coordinates. There is some amount that I have displaced it. That's the amount. This is the center of the box. And that's the amount I have displaced it. So I'm gonna do the same here to my box. And I'm going to displace it by... Uh, where's my shader? Sorry. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to displace it by some amount, something like that. 
0.2 units. There we go. So now it's rotating, not in the center. And now we are going to transform the point P by this uh, sectors stuff. And I'm going to call it Q. So first thing we need to detect in which sector we are. Let's call it sector. And what we can do is, let's say, let's see. Uh, we are going to compute first for any point P. And I'll draw that thing again. So there is all the symmetry with the boxes and all that. And any point P will have a given angle relative to the origin, right? This is going to be our angle alpha. And alpha, as you know, if this is P, uh, alpha is going to be the arc tangent, arc tangent of P dot Y and P dot X. And that will give us the angle. And then knowing that we have 12, well, I drew eight, but in our case, we are going to have 12. So since we have 12 sectors in the whole uh, sphere, then we can divide by 12 to get which sector we are in. Um, so let's do that. We are going to take um, our a tan of p dot y, p dot x, divide it by 12. And well, actually, we have to divide it by the size of a sector. So angle uh, sector is going to be uh, the whole circle, which is 2 pi radians divided by 12, right? That's the angle that makes a sector. So now uh, we compute the angle divided by how much a sector is, and then we can, uh, let's round it. We can round it, and that will give us a number from 0 to 11, telling us, telling us in which sector we are. Now, if we are in sector 5, to bring something back to sector number 0, we have to rotate it 5 times the amount of a sector, right? You, are, you have a point in sector 5. Uh, so in order to bring it here, we have to pump, 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 rotate it five times, as many times as sectors we have. So we are going to rotate a point, and let's rotate a point by, um, let's see, uh, this is a 2D rotation matrix. I don't know if it's worth going through this. Um, let's assume no for now, and finalize the symmetry thing, and then we can explain rotations if you want. But basically, we are going to uh, do this. So here we are rotating the point in the xy plane, uh, sorry, xc plane. y is always vertical for me, like OpenGL. So I'm going to make a, like a flat gear sitting on the horizontal plane, which means I'm going to rotate uh, the point evaluation point in the xc plane, in the horizontal plane, by an amount of an with for angle. And the angle is. Well, the size of a sector times how many sectors uh, we need to rotate. Uh, and that didn't work at all. <laughs> OK, let's see what we did wrong here. Um, mm -mm. Uh, P equals, OK, if anyone can see it on the chat, let me know, by the way. Uh, what about we first do? Well, this will be the same. It should be the same as doing a round. Um, OK, guys, this is why I should rehearse things a bit more. Um, hmm. Oh, I think I know. This should be the C component, right? There we go. OK, so. I was measuring the angle by using the y and this x components. I got confused because in the equations in the math um, here, in the math here, I was putting y because I was working in 2D. But in in, in our case, you know, we, we have 3D space x, y, and z. And we are, as I said, we are making this symmetry around the uh, xc plane. So we are trying to measure this angle here. Um, so we need to use x and c for the arc tangent. So that was the mistake. Uh, let's go back to coding. All right. So th that's the symmetry. Look at that. It's already it's already working. Uh, indeed, if we change the amount of 
you know the, the angle of each sector to eight then we get eight or three or twelve and the beauty of these is that um, this is free like I mean free there's an arc tangent and some sine and cosine um, things going on here but uh, we are only evaluating one SD box and that's one of the beauties of SDFs that as I was saying before um, besides rounding and, uh, and, and a few other things there is also this powerful feature where adding multiple instances of a single object can be done normally pretty easily without having to create a complex you know, instancing system and for sure it doesn't consume more memory or even more compute time uh, because if you have instancing in a regular rasterizer you still have to be smart about which one of those instances you are going to send to the renderer like sure you are saving memory by instancing but still if you want to save fill rate as well and vertex processing and all those things you still have to put bounding boxes to the instances and pull them with a frustrum or even with distance or do LOD things and it gets complicated quickly while here we are still evaluating only one of the 12 or a trillion boxes that we might have without really bounding boxes or without uh, any advanced nothingness other than a few lines of math which is like four lines certainly way less lines of code that it would take to build you know a frustrum calling and properly compute shader based calling instancing system or something anyway uh, we're not here for that we are here to do more maths so um let me see we got the, the sd box and what time is it maybe it's time for q a oh yeah we spent an hour already okay this is going fast i have to move on fast let's uh see if there's any questions i think there is not going to be any questions and i'm going to give you like a 10 seconds and if we don't find any we will move on and keep coding new maths which is the fun thing of all of this i think okay people are silent which i take as a sign of everyone is on the same page and then let's keep moving all right let's remove this thing and go back to the code so what should we do next uh, if we want to make our gears um well let's connect them with a uh, with a ring um let's see so let's make another shape that connects all the um all the gears together so we're gonna do something where in top view you know we have uh well now i won't be able to draw it properly but we have all these um teeth and now we are going to create kind of a torus but, but like a square torus that connects it all like that so eventually we get a shape that is more like what you normally think of when they tell you about a gear so something like that that kind of shape but uh, all the way so we are gonna combine or fuse two objects the gears that we have the two that we have and a square uh torus so let's make a torus quickly i don't know if i should explain that part let's do it just in case so i'm not gonna make a torus i'm gonna make a ring a 2d ring and then we will extrude it for 3d but basically uh, the idea of the ring or making a ring or anything that has uh, some thickness to it you know like a ring is basically a circle like that which grew some thickness inwards and outwards and it became like a solid ring here like that and that can be done this kind of inflating things or giving thickness to basic shapes can be done super easily by using first the basic shape and then applying an absolute value and this is this is another trick that uh, from SDFs that you know if you wanted to make a ring normally you would have to create the interior shape which might be you know like a uh, uh, like I don't know like a sphere like a sphere or a cylinder and then make another cylinder and then subtract one from the other you know like okay let me draw it in 3d maybe you would have to make a cylinder but let me make it big big cylinder and then subtract a cylinder from it and then you would have to cut it or slice it and then you would have the ring that you need so that's three operations but we don't need the you know cylinder minus cylinder with sdfs because once you have let's say the distance to a circle of radius r 
and this is the distance here to point P uh, then when the distance is negative like in this other P here uh, if you take the um, absolute value of the distance and then you subtract a number again then you that makes a ring so let me explain so okay let me make it bigger so this is the ring part of it and P and Q we have two points Q so as you know as we said before with the box you know we before we had a box and then we rounded it by or inflated it by subtracting an amount and then we made a round box now if we take the the circle and we subtract an amount of let's say one unit then we are going to infl inflate it as well we are going to go to the next isosurface easy peasy just like we did with the circle this amount here uh, with the box that amount would be like this amount now to create the interior side before doing that subtraction or that inflation or i don't know how you call it like inflating the sdf by that by, by that amount b if we take the absolute value of the distance field meaning that q which has a negative distance because it is in the inside of the circle becomes a positive distance it's equivalent of moving the evaluation point to p right this is a uh, to a distance of plus b this is a distance of minus b so by doing the absolute value q is like if it was at p at the position p so basically if we take the distance field and we do the uh, the absolute value and then we do the inflation then we can get um, a new distance field which is like a ring uh, okay let me show you that it's gonna be easier to do than to explain i, I guess so uh, let's compute a second distance to a ring uh, p dot x y uh, minus what is the size of our ring i don't know let's make it 0.15 because i know the box is at a distance of 0.2 so 0.15 should go at some point through the boxes um, so that's our cylinder uh, well first of all the main operation of course is combining two shapes so we have d uh, let's call it d1 uh, d1 is our teeth d2 is going to be our um, ring and then the mean operation is going to compute the union of the two shapes because of course as you need to evaluate the surf uh, the distance to the closest surface if you have you know two objects like a sphere and it's called that uh, and a point p and this is d1 and then you have uh, a box somewhere and this is the closest point from P and this is D2 then the closest distance to the scene which is the scene is just the combination of the two objects the closest thing the closest distance to anything uh, is the closest distance to any of the two shapes so whichever D1 or D2 is smallest that's, that becomes the distance to the scene if a new object happens to pop up somewhere like there a cylinder and this distance D3 happens to be smaller than d1 or d2 then d3 would become the distance the overall or the global distance field for the scene um, so basically uh, we can create the distance the global distance field by using the mean or the minimum or the smallest of all the distances involved uh, in the in the objects of the scene so in this case we have the cylinder but as i was saying um, well first of all let's clip the cylinder quickly Let's um, slice it by doing some uh, something like that. Oops, wrong. Um, uh, okay, so that's slicing it. Let's do that for now, so we can see what's going on there. And I'm gonna move it a little bit up. That's too much. Okay, so that's our cylinder. I just clipped it quickly. Uh, okay, I guess I should explain this now. <laughs> but basically, one of the operations to that you can do with distance fields, you have the mean operation, which kind of combines shapes. You can also uh, not only combine them by making the union of them, but you can use one shape to cut or to clip through the other shape. And you can do that with the max function. We will explain that later. Uh, I want to quickly jump into the actual ring 
uh, equation. So what I was saying before is that, you know, we have a point, the distance to a point, which we have expanded by 15 units to create um, uh, the shape of a cylinder. That's equivalent to taking the sharp box and expand it to create a round box. In this case, you can see the distance to a cylinder like the expanded version of the distance to a line, uh, which in this case is this length of PXC, and 15 is the amount of expansion. We are going to a ESO surface, which is 15, what, 0.15 units from the center of the line. Now, as I was saying before, in order to create a ring or an onion, as I call them, onion shape, what you can do is to take the absolute value of that and then subtract something again. Uh, let's say this. So what we did is, as I was drawing before, take the distance to the cylinder. Uh, anything that is in the exterior is going to be expanded by another uh, 0 0.01 units. So it's gonna be, that's going to be the outside side, the outside wall of the new cylinder. And then anything that is inside of the cylinder, which has negative uh, distances, because of the absolute value, is going to be moved to the outside again before evaluation, and it's going to return a positive distance as if it was outside. And then by subtracting again the 0.01, um, we can eventually make it negative and consider it in the interior of the new shape. And the interior of the new shape now is that boundary between the exterior and the interior of the ring. I don't know. I don't know. That's a very good explanation. But basically, let me show you intuitively what this is doing. So we have uh, the first number here, which was the size of the cylinder, the radius. So bigger makes it bigger. Smaller sizes make the cylinder um, oops, smaller as well. So let's go with a size of 0.15. Oh, did I, what did I press here? OK. And now the second one is how thick uh, we want the ring shape or the onion skin to be, meaning how much room do we leave before the, you know, the exterior and the other exterior side of the ring. So there are two exteriors now, one on the right side, one on the left side, everything in between. It's going to be negative distances, and that's going to be the solid part of the new uh, cylinder with the hole. And that second number defines how big that is. So 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 makes it bigger, and the smaller makes it smaller. So um, I don't know. Let's, we can. I think we can keep it just like 0.2, maybe. And now what we need to do is to slice the cylinder not only once in the top part as I did, but also in the bottom. Now, this is similar to carving a hole in the cylinder, which, you know, this shape that we just made, as I was saying earlier, we could do it in two ways. The way we did it with the absolute value or with two cylinders. We could have a big cylinder and carve a smaller one. The problem, even though that's easier maybe to visualize, the problem with that is that there are two cylinder evaluations. So it's more expensive for no good reason when you can just use an absolute value once you have learned and gained some intuition about how this works, which you can get by playing with it a few times. Um, now, I mean, in one way to think about it is also that these two cylinders that you would be using to carve one from the other, they have the same center. All that changes is the radius of it. So you could reuse many of those evaluations. So if you were hard coding two cylinder equations and do the subtraction to create the hole in, inside the first cylinder, and then you were optimizing the code and extracting all the parts which are the same between the two cylinder evaluations, which is almost all of it except for the radius, then, and you would put in that, you know, as a common uh, piece of code for both evaluations to use, and you kept simplifying and simplifying, you will you would end up with this, basically. You would eventually be able to remove the branches that you have and, and reuse the square roots and everything, and you would have eventually one length operator, one op apps operator, and these two subtractions. So. You can uh, you can land in this uh, onion modeling tool or ring modeling tool just by thinking about it on paper or by trying to optimize the naive way of doing things. I usually use both ways of uh, exploring and and, and um, both ways of exploring and and sorry I realized I wasn't sure in the code both ways of exploring and learning. So sometimes I write things in paper 
and you know I do all the equations about the things I have in my head and then equations show up and I try to simplify and find the most compact and most pure version of the maths and then code it and some other times I start coding the naive thing for which I have a solid intuition and then I try to find uh, pieces of code which can be reused uh, symmetries that I could use not by visualizing it but just by pure looking at the code where there is a minus sign in one side of the branch and there is a positive side uh, sign on the other side of the branch then well maybe I could remove the branch and use a sign function or an absolute value or something so there is also that way of reasoning where you simplify code and keep simplifying and simplifying and simplifying and then the mathematical truth that you didn't have an intuition for poof, shows up to you because eventually the whole code collapses into something super tiny that has a clear mathematical uh, meaning to it and then is when you can take that equation formula and go back to the paper and try to understand the meaning of it so normally I do both uh, meaning in some cases I use one in some other cases I use the other one and sometimes I do uh, both I start from a basic intuition that guides me some to how to write some code the code then helps me see some of the symmetries that I don't see by visualizing in 3D because I, I am not that good visualizing 3D space and the code helps me you know uncover those symmetries and then I go back to the paper and eventually those things connect and I have my final SDF um, okay so uh, yes I apologize for apologize for not showing the code but uh, what, what, what we had before was I will go very quickly through it so we had uh, the rings uh, sorry the tooth in the shape of a ring I added um, uh, a cylinder with the equation of a cylinder, which is the equation of a circle but in 2D. And I explained how the mean operation can be used to combine those two shapes. And then I uh, clipped the cylinder by using uh, the uh, by using the max operation operator, which I can explain later. And then I explained that instead of having the two cylinders, you can have a single cylinder by using the absolute value of the distance to the single cylinder, uh, making the interior and exterior side again, and then subtracting something from it to create uh, a new interior. And now the next step is to create a second clipping plane, which I'm going to do again. Instead of adding a second plane, I'm going to use the absolute value once more to kind of duplicate the plane on the bottom side of the uh, middle of the ring you know so we have the, the zero level the zero height where the ring is I clip something above a given amount of uh, 0 0.01 units uh, 0.2 would make it higher 0.1 is above so I'm clipping there if I want to clip below from a distance of negative 0.1 units then instead of an, uh, adding another plane I'm going to use an absolute value which I think I should be able to do just like that yeah so no matter whether you are up or above the you know horizontal plane the xc plane i'm going to consider that you are always above just like in the box we always considered you are in the first quadrant and then apply the clipping plane uh, only on the positive side so now we can do this smaller and i don't know what should we make it uh, let's make it 0.3 there we go and maybe we can make the um, these things a bit smaller again here, like that. And maybe the teeth are smaller like that. Okay, that looks cool. And then should we move the teeth a bit inside? 15. That's too much. 17. Okay. And what about we do that ring a little bit wider? Okay. Right, look at that. Okay, those two are too rounded, so I'm going to make them uh, less rounded by taking this guy here. 0.5, actually 0.1 is fine because it connects nicely there. Okay, it's fine. Let's keep it like this for now. Four. Um, no. Okay, actually it's this one here, right? 18th, yeah, something like that. <coughs> I don't know, guys, I think it's... Uh, I mean, at this point you can play forever and try to find the perfect values. 
I like this. I like that the teeth go a bit inside. I mean, I could probably prevent that by doing that, but I think that looks too simple. I like that a little bit of the teeth come to the inside like that. All right. So what should we do next to this? Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, what about we try to do the smooth maximum? So, yeah, well, how are we doing with time? Okay, I think I have energy for one, um, one, one more deep dive into maths and equations. So, we are using the max function to clip the um, the teeth. Oh, you know what? Actually. This teeth, because we are clipping the whole shape with these two planes, those boxes don't need to be 3D anymore, they can be 2D. Just like the ce a cylinder is just like a 2D like circle, I guess, or like extruded circle. So we could have an extruded box, which is a 2D box, because we are going to clip it anyway. So this is the box here. We can remove all the Y components, like this and like that and go to here and replace VEC3 by VEC2 and then we should just get um, oopsie we should get still the same thing, right? so we are gonna combine the shapes and now clip them together there we go okay so those boxes are 2D boxes now, you, s you saw what I did, right? I just remove the Y component from the box equation at all. As I was saying before, most of these SDFs generalize to any number of dimensions easily, which I guess is yet another reason for doing things uh, by using max and length formulas and generalizing all the cases to a single one as we did with the box instead of having a lot of if statements. Because if you have if statements like case 1, case 2, case 3, those was, that was for 2D, but in 3D there might be like case 1, case 2, case 3, case 4, case, case 5, there might be a lot more cases, a lot of ifs, so just something as simple as going from 3D to 2D, it would require us to think for 5 minutes or 10 minutes or half an hour which cases we can remove and simplify, a big mess. Uh, but because we have a very compact equation, generalizing it to 2D was super easy. Just we had to change two characters basically. Anyways, the good thing now is that the clipping planes are taking care of the vertical size of the boxes as well, which means that um, they are perfectly flat and they connect very well with the, with the ring. All those teeth connect very nicely. So what I want now is, as I was saying earlier, I want rounded shapes for everything, right? Um, one way would be to, I guess, subtract some amount from all of these but this doesn't work in the Y component because the max function is not an Euclidean um, operator, which this means is that, so the mean operator returns always the correct SDF. So if you have two valid SDFs, and as you know, sometimes not all the SDFs we use are totally valid, as in they don't respect uh, true distances to objects. Sometimes we allow a bit of uh, variation from the mathematical true distance in order to be more flexible with our modeling tools and the shapes we can create and we can use noise and sine waves to distort distances but assuming you have two distance fields which are true and pure distance fields a sphere and a box and you combine them with a mean operator to make a union out of them the resulting union is still a perfect and, and valid SDF when you use the max operator to carve or to clip that's no longer the case. The distance you get from a max operator <coughs> is uh, a bound. It's, it, it's something that is uh, smaller than the actual distance, which means the ray marcher can still work. It won't really uh, you know, pass through it as it's ray marching. It will just take more steps than it should. So it's a bound to it, and also it's not Euclidean. It no longer has this uh, property where sharp corners create round uh, SDFs like the box did or the star that I painted did. Which that means that when I try to do an, uh, an inflate operation on it, when I try to remove some distance to kind of inflate it again, 
uh, the effect we were getting on the box of rounding things it doesn't happen anymore in the on, on the things that have been uh, the, that have gone through the max operation in this case the vertical clipping so as you can see the sides of the teeth get more rounded and bigger but in the y component uh, the the clipping is still very sharp it doesn't round so let's fix that because i did i do really want a round uh, teeth for this um, because that helps create this more natural feel into it. So we are going to use an X max operation, smooth max. Um, let me put some number here and we are going to code it quickly. Um, to show what that is, um, okay, let me first put the prototype here. Oop. For now, we are going to read on the max. So actually, I think I should be able to <coughs> point you to one of my uh, articles, which is, uh, 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 uh. all right, so let me go to, um, mm -mm. here, and so this is an example of how smooth uh, blending works, which what does is something that when you're trying to, uh, let's say the smooth minimum or the minimum of operation, which kind of combines things together, right? It makes the union. If you have the bridge and you have the snow and you use the mean function uh, to bring those two objects to the scene, then normally you get this very sharp transition, you know? Uh, only a single object can exist at any point in the space with the mean function is one or the other, whichever is the smallest, whichever gives the smallest distance to the point. Um, but there is the option or the pr or possibility to smoothly transition between one and the other and create in-between values where the distance field returns a little bit of one of the objects and a little bit of the other one. And that smooth transitioning can be done with a smooth minimum. It's called smooth because the shape it creates is smooth, as in, you know, the, the, the surface, surface normals uh, nicely transition between one and the other in a continuous way. And the same way you can do a smooth minimum uh, on, this, on the min function, which uh, makes unions, if you use the same technique for the max function, which makes carvings and clippings, then you can create smooth carvings and smooth clippings which means that if you have an object and you clip it, as we are doing now with the gears, instead of just making a sharp cut on it, it's gonna create a little bevel or a little edge, which is rounded in the part where the cut is happening. And that's what we want. So let's, um, let me show you how to create uh, that with maths again. There's uh, this function that everyone is using in shader toy uh, by copy pasting from other people and that's fine that's part of, part of the purpose of shader toy that you can you know learn from other people reuse code copy and paste get inspired modify what others are doing and all of that but at some point if you want to do things on your own and understand how all of this works uh, this is what you need to do and this is what we are here for so uh, smooth maximum so Let's say, we are, I'm gonna do it in 1D, one dimension, but the same applies with no changes to three dimensions, just because of this uh, uh, tendency of these equations to generalize easily to 3D. So let's say you have two functions, one and another one, A and B. Let's call this one A of X, and this is gonna be called uh, B of X. And if you were just returning the, you know, we want to compute the x max of a and b for some parameter k um, and if we just do the max of a and b then what we get is sorry i guess we get that and that right the max function no problem whichever is highest whichever is biggest that's the max but what we want is let me draw this we want something that it is A when you are far enough and from B, you know, when, when you're really close to one of the two objects, like in the example I was showing, when you are really close to the bridge, the bridge is all you want to render. So when you are far enough 
A is all you want. But as you get closer to B, we want to start deviating from A and smoothly transition into B such that at some point as well, when you are far enough from A and close enough to B, B totally takes over again. So there is this transition band that we want to create uh, between A and B at some point. And what we do is to define this distance between, this difference between A and B, you know, like this is A of X. When the distance between A and B or the difference is really big, B wins, the max of the both. And here as well, between A and B, when the distance is really big, um, A, won, A, A wins. But as you get closer and closer, and the two dis the difference becomes smaller, and we can call some threshold distance here k, and that's going to be that k here, then we want this smoothing behavior to kick in. So we are going to take the max function, which is the black line here, and add something. We, we need to go up, right? So we are going to add something that we need to find what that is. And this is what this exercise is about, to find in what do we need to add to max in order to create that smooth blending. And what we do know is that it's going to be parameterized by k. k is something that we as, a, as artists will define how big this transition area is, how wide it is. But what we do know is that it depends basically on the difference between a and b. No matter if it b is bigger than a or a is bigger than b, when that difference in absolute values becomes smaller than k, we want the behavior to kick in. So now we have to understand or de decide what that behavior is. So um, we do know that when the distance, so if this is the, if this is a minus b, we know that when the distance, or the difference, sorry, is really big, uh, this delta thing, this increment, we want to be zero. We know that when we are far enough, when k is really big, this is k all the time, right? k. When k, well, sorry, this is a minus b. a minus b. When a minus b is bigger than k, we know that we don't want to apply any delta. We are happy with the, mi uh, with the max function. That's what we want. We want a or b to win. As we get, um, as k becomes smaller, and the two curves are closer to each other, we want the behavior to kick in, and it's going to be start small, it's going to start small, and then when the two are the same, when a equals b, at that point, when the difference is zero, it becomes maximum. We want a curve that has roughly this shape. Okay. Um, now, this point here, uh, by construction, we want that point to be smooth, so it's a good idea to make this point have derivatives equal zero. So one thing we can do is to make a parabola. So the let's go for the simplest curve. You know, like we can we could try to make a cubic function, a quintic function, something or degree four maybe to avoid square roots. Who knows? <clears throat> but let's try just the parabola, a degree two equation to see if that does the job. And if it doesn't, then we can try to increase the degree. But the natural choice is first to go with the simplest thing. So. We are going to do something where um, delta of k, sorry, delta k of a minus b is going to be a parabola of, so this thing is inverted, right? So it's going to be k minus the difference, and this thing is going to be squared, meaning a minus b equals 0 there because it, they are the same. Then we have k squared, and when a minus b equals k at this point uh, a minus b equals k k minus k is zero then we get zero so all we need to do now is to find probably some magic factor here that determines actually you know how big uh, the parabola is gonna it's gonna go so this is what we need now we have to find m and the trick here is that m is going to define this. This is m. This amount here is m. Is how much? Well, that's uh, sorry. That's m k. Right. When a equals b, uh, this is zero, and then we have m k squared. Sorry for that again. So it's m k squared. That this amount there. So we need to find m such that m k squared. This point up here makes the left side and the right side of delta because remember there are two deltas here 
one in each direction one when a is bigger than sorry b is bigger than a and when when a is bigger than b so we are you know there's the left and the right side to do all of this and we want uh, these points to match and also we want this curve to be smooth so the trick in this case is to find an m which produces continuous derivatives for the s max function so if we didn't take care of that we could end up with something where okay let me see if i can draw that so we had a and we had b and we could create something where this goes like that and then it does that you know like in the transition band we create a discontinuity here we don't want that we want something that is perfectly smooth so we have to ensure derivatives are continuous so uh, the trick here is to compute the derivative of s max when we are on the left side compute the derivative of, of s max when we are on the right side and equate those two things so okay let's do x max uh, derivative on the left is going to be the derivative of this thing right so um, oh but on the left side this whole thing evaluates to a on the left side the max of a and b is a a is bigger so the derivative of max a b is actually the derivative of a so we get a prime plus and now we need to compute the derivative of delta k with respect to x which is the thing so that's going to be m is a constant factor uh, the 2 comes down the inside of the parentheses stays the same and now we need to compute the derivative of the absolute value of a minus b um, but because we are on the left side absolute value of a minus b because a is bigger is just a minus b so the derivative of k minus a minus minus plus b the derivative of that is this is zero because it's a constant this is prime and this is prime so we get minus i prime plus b prime all right now the derivative of x max when we are coming from the right side is the derivative of max a b which in the right side evaluates to just b so we get b prime and then the derivative of delta k again evaluated coming from the right side so m is a constant again 2 is exponent which comes down because it's a polynomial um, that we are making the derivative of so the inside stays the same and now on the right side we need to compute the derivative the derivative of the inside of the parentheses but in the inside of the parentheses now on the right side b is bigger than a so this becomes b minus a so this is that and the derivative of that this is a constant so this is zero and then we get prime and prime so this becomes i prime minus b prime all right now we want these two things to be the same just like that so okay let's group some terms here and see what's going on i move b to the left side and okay so first thing actually we want this to be the same when right here in this point in this point e, um, a equals b so on those points because a equals b this is zero um, so actually we can remove that and now if i keep equating things here i'm gonna I move b to the left side of the equation and then i have two m's k uh, minus a prime well, actually i'm gonna put a minus here and make positive a prime minus b prime and then i'm gonna move also the other one to the left side so it's gonna be minus 2mk again a prime minus b prime all right now this equals zero because i moved everything to the left side of this what well, to the upside i guess of this equal sign here now if i group things further i get 1 minus 2mk minus 2mk is minus 4mk this needs to be zero regardless of the values of the derivatives of a and b so one way to do that is to make this whole thing equal zero which means 1 minus 4mk 
equals zero. Therefore, m, which is the thing we are looking for, equals uh, this goes to the right side is positive, and the 4k goes dividing on the other side for 1 over 4k. So, if we code this, and I ran out of paper here, but basically it's going to look uh, s max of a b is max a b uh, plus delta, which is uh, m, which is this thing, 1 over 4k, times, um, oh, also delta, we want it to be 0 when a plus b, so okay, so we have to do actually the max of k minus absolute value of a minus b, 0 squared. All right, this is our s max function. So, uh, Let's code it. Um, I have uh, coded and used S max so many times that I know it by heart now. So I think I got it right. Uh, that one over 4K rings very familiar. So let's go here. So we need to compute first uh, delta, which we said was the max of k minus absolute value of a minus b is 0. And then we said we are removing 1 over 4, OK, so 0 0.25 over k times delta, uh, no, sorry. This is not delta. This is just yes, part of it, I don't know, h. I think I normally call it h. All right. Uh, this is a max. We are adding delta. All right, we got it. F we got it right on first attempt. Excellent. So now the k uh, function, the k value, of course, is controlling the width of the transition band. So if we make it very, very tiny, we are going to keep the original max behavior all the way to the very point where the two surfaces touch and we are not going to even notice it. So that's what we are seeing here. We are seeing a pure max kind of clipping operation because I made k really tiny. I made it 0 0.0001 uh, here. But as we make it bigger and we increase the transition band, we can see here how uh, we are slowly getting something that is more round and, you know, the, the, the imagine the plane that is clipping things is, is smoothly kicking in. It's not just right away clipping everything out. It's as you get closer to the plane, starts to clip slightly until it clips uh, or, or yeah, cuts a lot of geometry. So yeah, we got uh, some uh, max, smooth max here going on, um, which is great. So now something we can do to this is complete uh, modeling. Uh, let me see. I see in the chat, there is no more questions. Um, no, there aren't. And time. Okay, we still have some time. Okay, let's keep going. I'm going to add a more geometry here. I'm going to create a, a cross, fun, a, a cross shape. You know, like two sticks to put in the middle of the, um, to put in the middle of the gear. And there's another trick that we can use here to reduce number of evaluations again. So this is a nice one too. So let's do um, d2 again equals the cross. I'm going to pass p. And, and then we are going to combine the cross with the geometry that we have so far. And um, all right. So it's going to be a, let's do a 3D cross. All right. Uh, OK, SD cross, not to confuse with the cross product. So, so we want to make a cross, all right? Which is just kind of like that, two boxes, a thin box and a thin box uh, intersecting each other. So actually, let's, let's, let's do that first. Let's compute a box. Um, and we know how to compute boxes here. So P, uh, let's get what's the, mean 
of d1 and d2. So r is going to be again the dimensions of the box, you know, width, height, and well, semi height, semi width, and semi depth. <coughs> and we are going to compute one of the boxes in the x, y, z uh, directions. But for the other one, we are going to rotate the whole space 90 degrees. And we are going to call z, we are going to call it x, and the x, we are going to call it z. So there we go. And now here, um, let's 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 create a box of I don't know 0 0.2. Let's see how that goes. Okay, <laughs> great. I got it on first attempt. Excellent. Okay, so that's our box, our cross. So far, so good. Uh, let's make it thinner because I'm also going to. You know, round it a little bit. That's too much for sure. Okay. Um, but just in the spirit of, you know, using absolute values to repeat things, interior and out and exteriors for clipping things with one single object instead of two, in the spirit of moving everything to the first quadrant to evaluate points uh, for a box, distances to a box very easily, and in the spirit of moving things around the sphere, around the circle, to the first sector in order to create repetition with only single evaluation. Let's also simplify this thing and evaluate a single box instead of two boxes for the cross. So what we can do is, um, well, first, it doesn't hurt to compute the absolute value of p anyways, because this thing is symmetric. And now let's return only one box. But what we're going to do is, uh, in some cases, you know, when you ha when we have a box like that, as we have now, um, and when we are around that uh, area, around that line, that's the box we want to evaluate. But if, a, if the point is really up there, uh, this virtual box, which doesn't exist yet, that would be closer to the point than this one. So we all would only need to evaluate that box, right? So before we were doing brute force, we were computing the distance to one box, to the other one, take the minimum. But now, just by the symmetry of the uh, two boxes, we know that if the point is on the, you know, on the bottom part of the plane, this is going to be closer. And if it's on the upper part, this one is going to be closer. And actually, the, the, the line in the plane that separates the two regions between one of the box being closest or the other one being closest is the diagonal. So everything above this diagonal is going to have this box as the closest object. OK, let me draw it. I don't know what I'm doing this with my hands when I can't just draw it. So we have one box, and we have the other box. So what I'm saying is that there is this diagonal here where everything in region 1 all these points, P, they have this box as their closest box. And all the points P in this area have this box as, this, as their closest uh, box. So we don't need to evaluate both boxes. If you are here, you can evaluate one. And if you are here, you can evaluate the other. Now, instead of doing that by you know doing a big if with one evaluation or the other, what we can do is just, as we were doing with the box, every point that lays in uh, region 2, we could just move it here to have the equivalent distance in box 1. We can just um, do this transformation where we just mirror it to the other side of the plane. So a point like up here, we just mirror it to, 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 to all the way there, right? And a point, let's say, here, which closest distance is that, uh, we are going to mirror it here. So that its closest distance becomes that. So we are going to mirror the point P along this diagonal um, so that we can evaluate only a single um, box. And there are many ways to do this. Uh, we could perform this reflection with actually with a reflect GLSL instruction, which is a dot product and a few things. But I think we can also do it in this case even though normally I'm against conditional branching, in this case, we can simply do that. If we are above the line, then we can just, uh, uh, oopsie. 
P. Why am I writing Q? It's P. We can just reflect it like that. We can just wrap the coordinates. Uh, be aware though that when you have, um, you know, ternary operations like this simple if statement that we have here with if if C bigger than X then do this thing, otherwise this other thing. These are conditional assignments and this actually does translate normally to a conditional move instruction. It doesn't really evaluate, you know, it doesn't do a comparison, set a flag uh, in there in some register and then do a jump based on the flag or anything like that. It doesn't do really branching and control flow. It doesn't really mess up with the threads. What it does is just um, a conditional move. It's a hardware instruction, probably a micro, at micro instruction level, it does branch maybe, I don't know. But basically, it's not bad. You can do it that way, or you again, or you could use a dot product and reflect things with a, you know, with a sign or a step function or something. So now we only have one length operation, one max, one apps. So we reduce the cost of this to half. So why not? It's not like we are gonna increase the performance a lot, but then everything helps. So so far we had, you know, originally we had like twelve tooth, twelve boxes for the tooth plus two boxes for the cross. That's fourteen boxes. Now we'll have only two, one for the teeth, one for the cross. So it's seven, seven x um, performance improvement and less code to compile for the driver and all great things. So the next thing I'm going to do is start to position this um, gear into place in the in the sphere. So if you remember the original shader, which I still have here. Uh, we are making one of these guys and we need to place it uh, not in the center of the uh, at the origin of the world that we have now we have to move it up there but besides moving it as you can see here the gear uh, the shape of the gear itself it's following the shape of the sphere as in it's not a flat gear you know the top and the bottom of the gears are not just flat as we have now because they are clipped with the vertical component of uh, the points in space but it's really curved and we can do that by actually not clipping against a fixed height plane but to clip the 2d gear that we have built because remember these two these teeth and the ring are really 2d and then we clip them we can clip those 2d shapes against the sphere itself and then that should give us like a you know like a like spherical shape uh, for the gear so let's see what are we doing the clipping here this is the clipping, isn't it? Yes. Um, so what we can do instead of using Y, what about we use R for the radius, so length of P. So this would be, R would be the radius of, or the distance to the center of the sphere where all these gears are rotating. So it would be somewhere in there, in the middle of the, of the whole mechanical, uh, system here and then we can do that we can use that minus some amount like that okay where, where did we go okay okay let me move the camera farther away so we see a little bit better um let's put this thing here it's too far okay move up the camera like that Okay, and now that's still too much, too much curved, too curved. All right. Yeah, and now let's move the camera again. Okay, I like that. Okay, so we have our gear. Um, we are getting a second copy for free actually down there because the uh, we are clipping based on the distance to the center of the sphere and the distance both you know above and below is the same so we are getting uh, both copies for free and now what we can do is to connect uh, those gears to the center of the sphere right like um, to the center of the um, to the origin of the world so we can create these uh, sticks here and so let's derive <laughs> one more SDF. <coughs> uh, we can create the SDF of a uh, stick. So I guess as the 
let's call it stick of p. Well, this is going to be a, actually a vertical, so v stick, very concrete, and it's going to be of height 0.5 because I placed uh, those gears at a distance of 0.5. This is this thing here. So. Right, so let's define the SDF for a v step, uh, v stick. Oops. So, how do we do that? Well, paper and pencil. Paper and pen, in this case. So, we want to compute the distance from a 3D point to a vertical line. Well, we, are, we will give it some thickness, of course, and make it like a capsule by subtracting from some amount from it, by rounding it again. Uh, but so this is our height, and this is the thing we want. And we want to compute the distance from any point to there. So let's say we have a point uh, here, P. Oh, I said I wouldn't draw in 3D today, but well, whatever. So let's see. Well, let's make this one a bit higher, just for... Okay, so that's our point P in space. And we want to compute this. This is the distance, right? This is how far the point is from the from the line. At least if the point is at a height which is in between 0 and the maximum height. So in this case, let's see. We know this distance. This is the length of P. Um, we know this one here. This is the y component of p. So d, which also is this distance here, uh, that's making a right angle triangle here, right? Which I can draw into the like that, where this is the distance we want. We know its height is p dot y, and we know p length of p is the hypotenuse. So we can solve this through Pythagoras again. So we know that length of p squared equals p dot y squared plus the other side of the triangle squared. We want to isolate d squared. So d squared is going to be, um, well, d is going to be the square root of p length of, length of p squared minus p dot y squared. Easy peasy. Now, there is a caveat though. Uh, the distance to this line is this thing here only if the height of the point lays between these two points here, between 0 and height of h. Um, if I do it in 2D, you know, this is, our, this is our line that we want to compute going from 0 to h, height of h. Uh, p is somewhere here. So this is the distance. This is in 2D. Now, when P is above this line, this point, the maximum height of the line, the distance to the line is no longer this. It becomes this. It's similar to case number three in the distance to a box, where if the point is you know, above and to the right of the edges of the box, then the distance it's not just a horizontal or a vertical line, it's really a diagonal line to the vertex of the box. So in this case, it's the distance to the vertex of the line. This is our distance d, which means now that uh, the distance we need to compute is basically this thing. Uh, so this is this size is p dot y minus h. And uh, 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 and what else do we know here? Um, well, we know this one as well, right? So basically, let me think. Yeah, I think this is equivalent of to simply clamping the point to... Yeah, I think it's equivalent to clamping the point to zero, right? So if we take this and uh, let me think about this. 
Hmm. Okay, let's write this in another way. I think this thing, we can expand it. And this is now when, uh, you know, you have to play with the pen and the paper. So this thing, p squared, is px, py, and pc squared. That's uh, the length of p. And then we are subtracting py squared. So these two things go away. And what we have, what we are even, uh, effectively computing here is the distance being px squared plus pc squared. And this is when we are in case number one. Case number two, it's up there. The distance is this length, which is the height, which is py minus h squared plus this distance. And this distance is this guy, which is, if this is x, sorry, c, and this is x, this is square root of x squared plus c squared. And then, because we have to square it, actually, we have px squared plus pc squared. OK, I see the light now at the end of the tunnel. So we are in a similar situation to the box where we had two cases to evaluate the distance to the line, but they can be generalized. The simple one, it's a special case of this one, where these two things are the same. And then for the second case, we have this term, which we don't have for the first case. So we can combine them and make sure that the first case evaluates this, but then clamps it to 0. All right, got it. OK, I think we can do this. So what this is going to be doing now is um, so we are saying we are computing the square root of px plus pc. And now we put, uh, let's call h, this would be uh, p dot y minus h. Uh, OK, let's call this one something else, d for delta, maybe. But then we want this to be 0 in case number 1. So there we go. We could generalize the two cases to a single case uh, and create this tick here. Um, all right, so now we can go here and give it some thickness like that. And yeah, I'm going to do something else here, which is I'm going to evaluate just things on the positive side of the plane. Um, like that. And I think we are done, aren't we? I think we have these gears now. And I think we could start creating more of them by symmetry. So what about I take all of this and I call it um, gear of p, and then I do. So I'm creating vec force for my SDFs, even though they only need to return a point. Sorry, a distance. I'm also returning the point that uh, evaluate was evaluated, so that, so that they can use it later for texturing and um, for yeah for texturing and some other things. So okay, so I just put all the SDF in a gear, so we can create uh, multiple of them. So the easiest way to create multiple would be to again create multiple, right? So let's rotate the whole space um, a little bit by I don't know EY, something like that, and then we can do d1 equals you know if d2 happen to be closest then d2 is our new distance, otherwise uh, it's the old one. So there we can create um, more gears like that. And then we can also rotate um, space again uh, by another amount. So I, I, took, I took the, you know, if this is x, y, c. Uh, in order to create the three rotations, um, I don't normally try to think how do the axes rotate. I just go by symmetries. And by symmetries, I mean symmetries in the code as well, that then translate to symmetries in the geometry. So if the first evaluation is in the canonical, 
a coordinate system x, y, z, and the second one became y, z, x, it's like I took x, y, z and shifted it y one position to the left, and the y become x became x, and the z became y, and the x came back from the other side and became z. So I'm going to apply another extra rotation. So I'm going to take y, z, x, and rotate it or shift it to the left again, and then the z becomes to the left, and the y, which got kicked out uh, of the of, of p, comes back from the right side as there. And this is very nice and symmetric because now when you read the code, and this is one of the reasons I always like to align the code perfectly, and you can see here that uh, I didn't write d2 there on the very left. I introduced four spaces on purpose to line up uh, the gear calls exactly with the previous one so that now I could compare the coordinates of P and make sure that the three of the gears, the three copies of the symmetry, they are all using XYZ in shifted locations. So the first one is XYZ, then CYZX, uh, and then CXY. And if I do it vertically, I can read you know, XYZ, which makes sure that it's not XYY or XYX, uh, then the number repeats, so I really did the right thing. The second column is YCX, again, one of each, and then CXY one of each again. So I am certain that these are the proper rotations. If I was doing this by rotating by 90 degrees with a, with, you know, with a matrix, I would be like, oh, should I rotate by minus 90 degrees or plus ni 90 degrees, or should I do it in X and then C and then C and then Y and, oh, such a big mess. Just uh, do it with the coordinates themselves and align everything properly so um, you can see visually that you didn't create any mistake because Oftentimes, mathematically correct things have very regular and um, organized code as a counterpart. So there we go. Um, all right, so we have this, but I am super non-satisfied with this at all. Well, first of all, let's move those gears. Let's pass time to the gears so we can animate them. And uh, I'm going to just use rotations again. I'm going to rotate the point P with, uh, with an angle which is just uh, time. OK, we have repeats. OK, let me do this. OK, so now we are uh, sorry, rotating those gears. And yeah, I was saying that this way of creating all these one, two, three, four, five, six gears is very non-satisfying because we are evaluating three gears, um, which is it's great. It's better than six. It's half the amount of work, but we can do much better. And the trick is, one again, to use um, the symmetry, to exploit the symmetry of the problem. And this is exactly the same as with the cross, which, by the way, we lost. The crosses are gone. You know the cross we had in the middle of the gears? They are gone. Let's fix that very quickly. I think we have to rise it by half. There we go. I shifted them up because now the gear, we moved it up by taking the two clipping planes and moving them up. So the cross has to move up as well to show up. But uh, in the case of the cross SDF, instead of having two boxes and evaluating two boxes, we did only one by using the diagonal um, the trick of the reflecting across the diagonal. So in this case, we can do the same because when you are in the neighborhood of one of those gears on the right side, there is no point on evaluating the gear at the top or the gear, gear in the front. And we can create splitting planes that create regions in space within which only one of the gears needs to be evaluated. And the, 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 the trick is to realize from this code that um, um, well, what we have to do, I guess, is to see which one of the x, y, and z axes we are most aligned with. And we can do that by, um, let's see, let's create uh, q, and now q is just moving everything to the first octant. And now we want to see q if it's closest to the x, y, or z axis, because if it's closest to the y axis, then we can evaluate the original gear that we had at the top. If it's closest to the x-axis, then we can rotate the whole problem 
you, to bring the point back to the vertical, to the first sector, kind of, to the first uh, uh, area, so we can evaluate the vertical gear there and give the same result as if we were evaluating the gear on the right side, which is the closest uh, gear when you are on the right side of the first octant. So what we can do is um, determine determine which one of the uh, three axes we are closest to. So we can take the just the x component, and if the x component is bigger than the y component and the and bigger than the um, and bigger than the uh, c component as well, then we can rotate like that, I suppose. Let's see how this works. Uh, no, that didn't work. What about this? All right, that work. Um, okay. All right, I had to <laughs> play a bit with the things until I found it, but basically now if the point is really close to the x-axis, we rotate the point such that the x becomes the y. And the c will keep it as it is. And the y, and the the y becomes the x, and a, and the x becomes the y. So that's what I did here. I turned, I swapped the y and the x. And if that is not the case, then the x is not the closest axis. But then maybe the y is. And if it is, if y is bigger than c, then um, what we need to do is to swap the. Um, no. <laughs> Uh, let me see. Sorry, if the C is bigger than Y, there we go. Yes, okay, that worked. Um, you see what I'm doing here? I'm doing something similar to the box and the cross, which I'm basically moving the evaluation points to the first sector. So the quadrant is split in three areas and the first area is the native, uh, sorry, the canonical area where the gear is at the top, uh, which is the y-axis. So if you are closest to the c or the c, c or the x-axis, we move the point to that first uh, reference sector. And now we are evaluating one gear only instead of six. So now we are getting a six um, x, which is really cool. Um, now let's also add. Uh, what time is it? One. Okay, let's do until one thirty only. It's gonna be two hours and a half more than I thought, but hopefully we can cover symmetries and a bit of lighting. So let me very quickly just add a sphere in the center of the drawing to kind of connect all those gear axes or pivots together. So it's gonna be an SD sphere uh, at P of radius. I don't know, zero point one. 0 0.15, 0 0.12, 0 okay. And now let's do more symmetry here. We need more gears. We need gears connecting um, the top. Okay, you know what? Let's do some, let's very quickly put some textures to this so we can see the shapes a bit better. So I'm gonna bring a texture. Uh, I think I, I used this one and then down here, and this is why I was using P, because P now gives me the point that we are using. I can texture, I can use P to texture, to sample our texture. And I don't know, what is P? P is T U W um, Y C. That looks okay. What about let's call this vec3 material color equals material and material. I'm gonna so I'm, I'm working in gamma space as you know from the other stream uh, live stream. I have this uh, pow curve which pretty much makes a square root on the colors uh, to bring everything to perceptual space from linear space. But because the texture is just in sRGB, which is close to perceptual space, I have to do the inverse transform, which is squaring the texture, the color, to make it more contrasty. So then later the square root brings up at the brightness. 
<clears throat> the trick is that I, I don't want to simplify the squaring and the square root because in between lighting will go and the, that one needs to happen in linear space which is in square space so yeah we have our things there let's colorize this a little bit let's do lighting uh, yes so super quick this is not a I don't want to spend time on lighting today because uh, we will do that another time so I will just use the normal dot y to uh, add a bit of lighting and also I'm gonna texture map it another time in another dimension I was using just a I'm using there a normal sorry a planner mapping in the in one direction I'm gonna use it in another dimension so we have two sets of textures projections going through the thing we could do a third one and do tri planner mapping or box mapping as they call it but it's gonna be fine I wonder if we can do a bit more light into this or something but I think it's okay for now we see what's going on all right um, boo, boo, boo. yes so symmetries I was gonna say let's add uh, the other gears by um, by using the same gear basically or maybe let's, I think we are gonna, we are gonna have to add more one more gear so we are gonna have you know like a d2 and, um, and then we are gonna do again our mean d equals if d2 the new gear is gonna be closer than the old ones then we go with the new one otherwise we stay with the old one and now we are going to call this QX, it's a new coordinate system and I'm going to... okay, I want to take the vertical gear that we have and rotate it 45 degrees uh, so we can fill those diagonals th that connect and we can connect the top gear with the side the gears so I'm going to rotate it... The rotate 45, let's say uh, Q dot x and y and the q and the c is going to stay the same so i'm going to play a 2d rotation to the x and y components so we do that but we keep the c the same so i'm going to create here a rotate 45 and rotating 45 degrees is as simple as uh, let's see i think we can Uh, subtract and add and that's going to increase the length so we have to multiply by the square root of 1 over square root of 2 which is how much is that let me open the calculator uh, I think it's 0 0.0 okay calc 0.5 and now square root of that uh, 0.5 and what, how do I remove this? I did it wrong. It's square root of 0.5. 0 0.07107. 0 All right. Okay. There it is. Look at that. Did we get it? Qx. Yeah, but we are having quite a few artifacts there. I wonder why. Qx time. Hmm. Hmm. Let's try this. No. Hmm. Maybe I did this wrong. Maybe we should rotate to the other side. Okay. Oh, oh not yet. I'm still seeing artifacts there. Uh, why that? Why is that? It's because Q. Okay, let me do this on P. On the Q should be P. I ah, know it's because okay, I was doing this on P on Q, but Q has been already weirdly rotated to create the symmetry of the other gears. So, all right. So here we have the second set of gears. Let me show it to you here. There it is. It is not rotating on the right direction, is it? No, those gears don't match. So let's have let's pass another 
variable to the gear that determines the spinning direction or actually um, instead of changing the spinning direction I don't like that I'm going to fix that by rotating 45 degrees in the other direction there we go okay so now they are spinning in the right direction but the gears the teeth don't mesh um, that's because they are doing that instead of that so we have to take some of the gears and shift them by half of the distance between two teeth so I'm gonna stop the thing here so we can see it. here you can see the clashing of the teeth so now yes now I'm gonna pass another parameter here that says how much to offset the gear in its rotation and I'm gonna call it offset and we are gonna use that here and we are gonna rotate it so if this is the size of a sector we want to rotate by half a sector so over 24 there we go that looks better let's add some occlusion very quickly to um, to see those connections better we already have here an occlusion function as part of this mini framework how is it called though? Um, calc AO alright calc AO um, overloaded function why? oh it needs time as well because the geometry is animated ok ok so we have created this gear now <coughs> where is it? There it is. Now we can create the other one, the counterpart, by using yet another symmetry, which I'm going to apply it again by detecting which axis this thing is closest to, which is either the X or the C. And if it's the X, sorry, the X or the Y, then QX is going to be QX dot. Uh, poof. I don't know. Um, all right, let me let me see. The C we want to keep as it as it is. Let's try. That almost worked. That almost worked on first attempt. I mean, it is there. It's in the right spot. It is rotating in the wrong direction. Or is it? Well, it is cor rotating correctly regarding this gear, but not regarding the top gear. You know what? Let's create the others, and then I will fix the rotations, because I suspect the problem is with the original three gears that we wrote. I think these ones are rotating correctly relative to each other. So these are the ones we created in the x-axis, and now we can create something similar by... Um, you know, rotating on the Y. So in this case, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go just here by code symmetry, not so much by um, um, 3D thinking or geometry. So okay, I'm gonna go fast here because I want to do a lot of lighting, just basic, basic lighting before going. Uh, this is Y, Y y and y all right so this is our new set of gears which again i'm creating four gears just by adding one more because we have symmetry vertically and then diagonally and now the last one this is going to be c and we got c x so this must be y and here we go y c so this must be x Again, not even thinking in 3D, just looking at the symmetry in the code, regularities, that should be all we need. Yeah, look at that. Okay. So, some of the rotations are not correct, so let me fix that. Um, 
the top one is clearly wrong. So what about here? I add an else and I said q equals q x y c and because this is the original one I'm gonna s I don't know what should I do here? Should I rotate it um, minus one one one? Okay, the top gear is working now. Uh, let's see the others. Okay, this one, the side one here, is incorrectly rotating. Right? Is that... I want to make sure that... Okay, so actually... Okay, let's go one by one. <laughs> I'm going to disable everything and only add the things that I know are correctly rotating. So this is correct. In, this is correct so far. Yes, that ring here is all correct. Now, this seems to be correct as well. So I'm going to add that gear now, which is not that one, but this one. Is that rotating correctly? No, it is not. So maybe this... Um, what about we rotate here by... Wait, is that the one I need? No, it is not. It's there in the back. It's there in the back. Where is it? there it's this guy that is wrong okay so what about i do my x yes that works no it worked with the top one oh boy okay you know what for the sake of time i am going to uh, leave it as it is now and i will well it is fixed in the actual in the original shader um that's what i did it correctly because we only have two minutes to finish so I'm gonna finish it here for now. We will do lighting next time uh, and motion blur and I think I didn't have time to solve the exact intersection between a sphere and, uh, and a gear. So what about I do another live stream to finalize this piece where we do motion blur, fast uh, ray matching through first uh, computing an intersection, we fix the lighting, we fix the rotations and we do a few other things. I think we can do that. It was fun. I will see you again next time. Thank you for supporting me on Patreon and uh, connecting to the stream. Cheers.